we are going to be talking about the 4 to 20 milliamp transmitter. In this video, we're going to start off with the circuit analysis, as well as the advantages that it has over transmitting signals as a voltage. You may notice that this is actually the same exact circuit as the non-inverting amplifier. However, instead of deriving VO, reference between here and ground, instead what I want to do is focus on finding the equation for this current, and then I want to find the equation for V out based on this current. So I can label my current here as I1, and now I can go ahead and label my node voltages. My VI source is referenced to ground, so I can call this node VI, and treating this as an ideal op amp, this will be VI as well. Now this node over here, we can call VX, and now we've labeled every node in our circuit. So now let's move on to writing the equations for our components. And let's start off with R1. We have that I1 is equal to VI minus zero divided by R1. Now something to notice here, I1 is only a function of VI, our input voltage, and R1. So that means that RL can be any value and I1 is not going to change. Now this isn't true in reality, obviously there's extremes that this won't work, but for an ideal op amp, we can say that RL can be any value and I1 is still going to remain fixed. For a real op amp, this is going to remain true as long as the op amp doesn't reach saturation. Now let's go ahead and write the equation for RL. And for that, we can say that I1 is equal to VX minus VI divided by RL. Now the last equation we need is for VO voltage label. And for that, we can write that VO is equal to the positive side, VX, minus the negative side, VI. So now the big takeaways from these equations is that I1 is fixed based on VI and R1. And if we substitute VO for VX minus VI, we can say that VO is equal to I1 multiplied by RL. So what this means is that we can set the current I1 with an input voltage, and we can get an output voltage based on I1, that current that we set by our input voltage, multiplied by that load resistance. So effectively what we've done here is we've created a voltage-controlled current source out of our op amp. So now what's normally done with a 4 to 20 milliamp transmitter is VI is set between 1 and 5 volts, and R1 is set to equal 250 ohms. Now plugging this into our I1 equation, 1 volt divided by 250 ohms gives you 4 milliamps, and 5 volts divided by 250 ohms is equal to 20 milliamps. So this sets the range that our 4 to 20 milliamp transmitter works at. So if we said that RL is equal to 250 as well, we could write that VO is equal to 250 multiplied by I. Now if I is equal to 4 milliamps, VO is going to be equal to 1 volt, and if I is equal to 20 milliamps, VO is equal to 5 volts. So in this way, we can take a voltage, turn it into a current, and then measure a voltage at the output in response to that that's the same as our input voltage. Now you might be wondering why I did any of this. I started off with 1 to 5 volts at my input, and I ended with 1 to 5 volts at my output. Why don't I just connect this voltage directly to my output? And based on what I've drawn so far, that would make a lot of sense. However, if we make these models more complex, we'll see that it's not that easy. So I drew VI as an ideal voltage source, but in reality, we need to use a Thevenin model and add a Thevenin resistance. So we can call this VI and we can call this RI. And another assumption that we had is that these are wires, but really a wire as an electrical component is saying that there's no potential difference and effectively resistance is equal to zero. And unless you're using superconductors, a wire is really just a resistor. So we have to add a series resistance for our wire. So we call this RW. And now we can add RL. So this is the circuit if we were to directly connect our input voltage to our output resistor. And the problem here is that VO is going to be the result of voltage division based on these resistances. We can say that VO would then be equal to RL divided by RL plus RW plus RI multiplied by VI. If RI and RW are anywhere near RL in size, we won't see anything like VI at our output VO. And you might be thinking, well, that's fine. I can say RL is much, much bigger than RW plus RI. And this fraction right here becomes approximately one and VO is approximately equal to VI. And that's true, you would be able to do that. However, you introduce a new problem. And that problem is electrical noise. There's always a noise in your environment. And if RL is a big value, then that noise is going to show up in your output. A noise source can be created like a Thevenin model as well. So say this is V noise and this is R noise. 
If we only consider our noise source and our load resistance, we can say that VO based on the noise, not based on the input, is equal to V noise multiplied by RL divided by RL plus R noise. So now we've run into a catch 22 where we want RL to be a large value. So that way VO is approximately equal to VI, but then VO is going to also be approximately equal to V noise if we treat them separately. So a high load resistance is going to allow for more noise to be in our circuit but a low value for RL is going to result in not seeing the output voltage we expect. Instead of using a voltage source, what if we had a current source? And we still have some series resistance, and this is RL, and this is our current going through. In this case, our series can be anything, and the current is going to remain the same because we have a current source. And the voltage we see at RL is going to only be based on I multiplied by RL. And now we're free to make RL be a smaller number, like 250. And because we're supplying this with a current source, our signal doesn't have voltage division, but the noise source that's still present in this system will have voltage division with this smaller number of 250. So this is greatly going to reduce the noise we see in our output, and it's going to prevent voltage division errors from our input. Now the last thing I want to address is why 4 to 20 milliamps? That seems very arbitrary. Why not 0 to 20 milliamps? That seems better because I have more range to work with to represent my data. Now the reason is, if I have a current source, and this is 0 to 20 milliamp, and this is my RL, and I'm looking for a voltage here. Now if the output happens to be at 0, I don't see any voltage here. VO is equal to 0 because I have no current. The problem with this is I don't know if this is outputting 0 or if there's a break somewhere in the line. However, if I represent 4 milliamps as my 0, if I get 0 volts, I know that my line is broken. However, if I see 1 volt over here, I know that I have a signal and my current is making it through the line and my line isn't broken. So for the next question, why 20 milliamps? Why not a larger number? You want the upper limit to be the largest possible number it can be because that gives you more range to represent your data and that can help you with your resolution. However, letting the current go too high can become dangerous and also consume more power. So 20 milliamps is the balance they struck. I hope you enjoyed this video and you found it helpful. And if so, please like and subscribe. I'll see you next time.